Critical race theory. You've heard it all before, right? No, you haven't. Will Cow starts now. Welcome to the program. I'm Andrew Wilkow. Critical race theory. By now, you've heard a lot about it. CRT seems to be everywhere. You may have even been confronted by its proponents in your local government-run schools, and you may think you've heard it all before. You haven't. There's a few more layers. Let's start with critical race theatrics. That's where pundits and politicians present childlike views of socialism through the prism of race based guilt. Here's an example. The particular Christians that we're talking about, uh, as I said, older, blue collar, rural whites are people who feel embattled, endangered in the country. They are people who feel that they face more uh, discrimination against them than African Americans do. Um, they think that uh, they see the Democrats have won the popular vote seven of the last eight times. They feel their power slipping away. In, within the culture, their power sleep, slipping away politically, economically, and so they're going to go to great lengths uh, to try to hold on to that power. That's why a majority of Republicans in January told the American Enterprise Institute the American way of life, the traditional way of life, is so endangered that we may need to use force to protect it. The idiocy of people like this is that they present racial equality as a weapon. A sword, not a shield. And if you tell anyone, anyone, I don't care who it is, that something is being taken from them, real or perceived, it's a guarantee that some people will become defensive. Then that becomes exhibit A for the left. See, they don't like their power being taken away. But that only works in the static pie theory. As I say often, abundance equals peace. You see, in a growing economy, there's less competition for scarce resources. In a free society, the means of production and employment expand beyond the theoretical static pie. But the new Marxist left believes that a ruling elite should control and distribute all resources, and they call that equality. Yes, everyone waiting in line for their ration. No, wait, now it's, it's equity, right? But the entire nation, the entire society is flawed until they can design a perfect outcome. In some fundamental ways, our system is still not fair. Uh, we do not have equal outcomes, whether we're talking about in the realm of criminal justice uh, or in terms of economic justice, uh, in terms of voting rights, civil rights. Um, and we've seen that uh, played out time and again. But the fact that we have greater awareness, we have greater commitment uh, to, to trying to em embrace policies and, and approaches uh, that recognize that we are all individuals of equal worth uh, and all have dignity. Um, and, and we deserve, each of us, an opportunity to fulfill our, our God-given potential. Mm -hmm. That's what Joe Biden believes. That's what uh, he is governing to achieve. Um, and we've made a very significant progress already um, working with Congress to put in place important measures that reflect that commitment to, to equity and to greater justice. So we must legislate equal outcomes. Critical race theory is nothing short of yet another attempt to force Marxism upon this nation through the side entrance. You see, most Marxists are smart enough they know they can't come through the front door. That part you may have heard before, but here's the part you may have not. The left doesn't have evolving standards, it has never-ending expanding standards, if you can even call what they demand a standard at all. See, CRT requires that anyone who does not fall into the now protected class of, try to keep up with this, B-I-P-O-C, that's black, indigenous, and people of color, it requires a total submission to anti-racism. And according to CRT, there's only racist and anti-racist. Nothing else. It doesn't matter how you live your life. And let me be blunt. If you're anything outside the BIPOC lines, you're automatically guilty until redeemed. Now, who holds the power of redemption? I guess they do. And they alone. Here's, here's how it works. Hard left scholars 
have created something that in their minds rivals an applied science. And its legitimacy is derived from their own minds. They are the experts. Now, I could play any one of many clips of the new celebrity of race baiting, Ibram X. Kendi, but this one explains how it all works. We, we even, for instance, have difficulty talking about medicine. <laughs> At the same time, we recognize there's a such thing as medical researchers and doctors, right? So can you imagine if, generally speaking, we didn't even consider doctors to have expertise, how difficult it would be for us to sort of have a conversation, a difficult conversation um, about, about medicine. And with that being said, part of the difficulty is you have so many people who refuse to accept their diagnosis. So he's the expert, he possesses all the knowledge and you possess none. So it's inescapable. You've been diagnosed and that's it. And there's no second opinion. So what's the cure? Well, whatever they say. And you dare not question. Anything short of total submission returns you to the category of racist. And from there, it's just a quick hop, skip, and a jump in to this deranged mindset of Kendi on capitalism. So when you think about, for instance, the slave trade, which was critical in the accumulation of wealth in Europe, that was fundamentally a, ra a set of racist policies. When you think of colonialism or even slavery, these are a, a relation, these are fundamentally a relationship between racism and capitalism, which was essential to its emergence. And so I think in order to truly be anti-racist, you also have to truly be anti-capitalist, as I write in the book. And in order to truly be anti-capitalist, you have to be anti-racist, because they're interrelated. Ah, uh, so, so, the, so there it is. The only way to redeem racism is to install communism. Did I mention that Karl Marx was an old white guy? And if capitalism is racism, is this how to be an anti-racist? Let's go to, there it is, Tarjay's website, where you could buy a whole bunch of products from Ibram X. Kendi, and he's making millions, right? So, so anti-capitalist that Tarjay. Anyone who opposes Kendi and his ilk are branded as the evidence of the racism they're trying to combat. Coleman Hughes, well, he's got a striking rebuttal to all of this. Quote, Kendi's goals are openly totalitarian. The DOA, or Department of Anti-Racism, proposed by Kendi would be tasked with investigating private businesses and monitoring the speech of public officials. It would have the power to reject any local, state, or federal policy before it's implemented. It would be made up of experts who could not be fired, even by the president. And it would wield disciplinary tools over public officials who did not voluntarily change their racist ideas, as defined presumably by people like Kendi. What could possibly go wrong? Exactly. A new federal agency that's unaccountable to the voter? Can we start chanting, this is what democracy looks like? Long ago, John McWhorter, speaking of diagnosing people, pointed out this about people like Mr. Kendi in his book, Losing the Race, Self-Sabotage in Black America. Quote, another truism about black education is that the burdens of societal racism hinder all but a lucky few black children of all classes from doing well in school. This apparently sympathetic notion has transmogrified into nothing less than infantilization of black people. Only victimology makes black thinkers so ominously comfortable portraying their own people as the weakest, least resilient human beings in the history of the species, unquote. While promoting the victim has become its own industry. It's also known as poverty pimping. CRT does nothing but divide the nation into white oppressors and non-white victims. CRT forces the numerical majority, keyword numerical, of people to submit themselves to an even smaller numerical, keyword minority, than the ratio between government and the citizenry. As it stands now, where a new ruling class is created, and only they get to enjoy wealth. But in the end, if it were to succeed, we, all of us, that's every single one of us, would all be in the peasant class. Ask yourself this. Who is oppressing Hispanic people 
in Latin American nations that gave themselves over to socialism? How about black people in African dictatorships? Or Asians in nations like North Korea? The idea that if whiteness is defeated, that freedom will rise? It's a lie. There are millions of people all over the world who are oppressed having nothing to do with whiteness. Let me work backward for a few minutes, and I'm not just going to go deep here. I'm going to go subterranean to the core. Critical race theory is just a cheaper version of Marx's class theory. To make it as simple as possible, the world breaks down into only two categories, victim and oppressor. There's always a victim, there's always an oppressor, nothing else. Always a bourgeoisie to the proletariat. Well, the first flaw in all of this is that Marx and Engels were observing 19th century Europe where, yes, there were rigid class structures. But they were unlike that of the republic known as the United States where we were and are, for lack of a better phrase, class fluid, where a person can be born into poverty but rise up on his or her own merits. And yes, I'm not going to stand here and deny. We, of course, have to account for slavery and its legacy. There's no denying it, but communism is not the answer. Now, where Marx made his first inroads into the United States was during the Civil War. Marx actually wrote well over 100 articles for the New York Tribune. Marx was actually disappointed in the outcome of the Civil War. Here from the International Socialist Review. Marx and Engels argued that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and the North's arming of black soldiers transformed the Civil War from a purely constitutional war to preserve the country with slavery intact into a revolutionary war. They did not characterize the Civil War as a socialist revolutionary war, but they believed that it advanced the cause of all workers, both white and black, by destroying chattel slavery. Now, Lincoln was a Republican, by the way, and slavery was a global condition, not one that was invented in the colonies that would become the United States. And we did fight a bloody civil war that ended slavery. But that's not what's being taught through CRT. What's also not being taught, and what upset Marx, what upsets Marx, is that free blacks became capitalists, not socialists. They were all Republicans. The 1619 Project falsely asserts that the entire nation was founded on slavery. The entire argument of the 1619 Project is that slavery predates almost every other American institution. That means that it is foundational and embedded in our culture. We don't even have to know how we've learned to think about Black people as more criminal, as more scary, or in the, in the case of trans kids, as uh, more muscular and, and so will automatically be frightening to um, these you know, little white girls. We don't even have to know how we learned that. It is embedded in our culture. And I think what is so important is understanding that intersectionality, you know, the, the term coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, which shows yeah. what black people have always known. Marginalized people have to fight for the rights of all marginalized people because it yes. never stops at just marginalizing one group. How do you how do you keep up with this stuff? So the nation was founded on slavery and that's why we have transphobia or something? Well, the basic premise is that the only justice is to have the United States undergo a communist revolution. CRT is Marxism by another name. Show me one promoter of CRT that isn't also a Marxist. Just one, and I'll stop talking about it. The current crop of CRT spokespeople demand an acceptance of a false narrative. Then they build up this construct from there. CRT denies the value of the individual, and the latest weapon is government-run education. The left has been pushing a critical race theory curriculum from kindergarten to higher education, and thankfully, some people have had enough. Ms. Hannah Jones is a friend of this show, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, a Peabody Award winner, and a genius in the literal sense. She was awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant in 2017. She was recently appointed to a prestigious role at the University of North Carolina's respected journalism school, a role that has been historically followed by the recipient being granted tenure at the university. But UNC's Board of Trustees denied Hannah Jones' tenure, reportedly bowing to conservative criticism over her most prominent work, the 1619 Project, for which she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize. 
It's too much to explain here. If you haven't read it, you should. But in the 1619 Project, Hannah Jones and others challenge our perception of America's history, pointing out that even before Plymouth Colony was established by the Pilgrims, the first enslaved Americans were already in the United States. You know, making some kids hate themselves and other kids feel like victims is not unity, and it's certainly not equality or equity. It says you're nothing without big government. I mean, maybe that's equal, equally miserable. But one group, if this succeeds, needs to forever be corrected and the other forever coddled. Parents are right to line up and push back. That's all parents. Take a look at this. See what a middle school teacher in Portland, Oregon, recently said on a Zoom call with her fellow teachers. If you're not evolving into an anti-racist educator, you're making yourself obsolete in this field of profession. Um, our district is only getting browner and browner with our children. And so if, you know, obviously you can't change your melanin, all right, but you can change your mind so that you can actually function in a, a district that is full of BIPOC children. So if you're being resistant, I understand that, but you're gonna have to eventually come to the light because if you're going to keep with those old views of um, colonialism, um, it's gonna lead to being fired because you're gonna be doing damage to our children, um, trauma. And so as we fire the teachers who sexually abuse our children, we will be firing the, the teachers who do racist things to our children and traumatize them. I gotta be honest, the theatrical costumes are on point here, right? But this is what teachers are talking about right now. And don't think for a second your school is exempt. They don't talk about this openly. This was a leaked Zoom conference call. Parents listening became so upset hearing this teacher speak that they uploaded the full call to expose it. Does a CRT-based curriculum prepare kids for the careers of the future? No. It does nothing but force upon the student hours and hours of useless revisionist history and indoctrination to which they will be graded on. University donors are right to cancel this. Banning CRT by a vote? Again, this is what democracy looks like. So here's the argument. Critical race theory does nothing but destroy. It destroys lives, it destroys communities, it destroys individualism, and yes, it destroys progress all in the name of empowering and enriching a handful of charlatans. It forces millions to trade one alleged oppression for another. There's never been a socialist revolution where the people ended up with more freedom. CRT does not advance the individual, and it does not make up for the past. Before the pandemic, the unemployment rate for non-whites was at the lowest in history. That's history. But that wasn't good enough for the hard left. Before the pandemic, wages were rising for all classes of people. That wasn't good enough for the hard left. If this nation were to undergo a total collapse to be rebuilt in their image, it'd be the same failure experienced by every other society that tried it. CRT does not teach, it indoctrinates. And the way to deal with this is in the open air of debate. The promoters of critical race theory should be expected to explain their plans, plans for the economy and everything else they want to affect or control, the desired results and how to achieve them. When they must speak in plain terms versus academic word salads, the majority of observers will become aware, to the come to the conclusion that CRT will not make the nation more fair or equitable. What it will do, what it's designed to do, will be to silence the critics of the left. Everything you're seeing right now related to critical race theory is nothing short of theatrics. But in the end, no matter where your seats are in the theater, the show is going to be terrible. All right, let me bring in a friend and colleague, radio host, author, attorney, and producer of the documentary Uncle Tom. He's the host of The Larry Elder Show. Uh, Larry, thanks so much for joining us again. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving me the time. All right, well, we had you on uh, when Uncle Tom came out. Now there's a part two coming out, so let's talk about it. Well, let, first let me get something off my chest about Uncle Tom. Uh, as you know, we just had the Academy Awards, and the film that won Best Documentary was something called My Life with an Octopus or something. I, I didn't <laughs> see it. I hear it was a good, uh, a good documentary. There were five documentaries that were nominated, 
If you look at the IMDb rating of each of the documentaries nominated, that's International Movie Database, that's kind of the Bible of, of movies, whether they're documentaries or not. Uh, these are reader reviews where anybody who saw the film can, can write it in. So somebody who hates the film can say they hate it. Somebody who loves the film can say they love it. My film got a higher IMDb rating than any of the five that, were, that was nominated. Frankly, a higher IMDb rating than any of the last 10 winners of the best documentary, uh, Oscar for Best Documentary. That's point one, point two. The film that won Best Picture, forget about Best Documentary, because documentaries don't make any money. The film that won Best Picture, Nomad Land, at the time it won Best Picture, believe it or not, my film at $3.5 million grossed more than that film did. When you have a film that does three times its cost, that's a smash hit. So far, Uncle Tom has done almost nine times its cost, completely ignored by the Academy Awards, despite IMDb rating higher than any of the ones, despite a Rotten Tomatoes rating uh, at least as high, if not higher, than any of the ones nominated, and the fi despite the fact that it grossed more money probably than all the other five documentaries put together. Aside from that, I'm in a good mood. Well, you, you know why that is. You produced the film. We had you on for a, a really extended interview about Uncle Tom, where you portrayed the black family in such a positive light before the so-called Great Society. And, and now here we are with, with critical race theory. You know, one of the arguments I made in the monologue was that Marx was upset that, that black Americans, when, they, when slavery ended, when blacks became free, they became business owners, entrepreneurs, right. capitalists, right. Republicans. There was, no, right. there was no socialist revolution in the United States, and that kind of gave birth to critical race theory. It was born out of class theory. And then up to the point of your film, where we saw the, the, the American black family, we saw the dad in the, in the plaid shirt, you know, mowing the lawn and waving at the camera. Right. Basically, uh, basically, life in America America as, as, as we know it, but then came the great society that collapsed in large part many black families, not all, and now we have this promotion of critical race theory which says don't go out there and try to achieve, don't go out there and get a solid education, fall in line, do as you're told, think like us. Absolutely. Uh, that was beautifully stated. I would not change one comma of what you just now said. Uh, let me add this. The whole basis for critical race theory is that every problem facing black America can be traced to slavery, to Jim Crow, uh, to white supremacy, to racism in America. And it is an absolute, total crock. If you look at history from the eyes of, a, of an economist, an economist would say, how did the South do relative to parts of the country that did not have slavery? And the answer is the South did not do nearly as well as other parts of the country did that did not have slavery. Virginia used to be the richest colony uh, in America, and within a few uh, decades, several states in the North passed it because they mechanized. It is why the South lost the Civil War. Speaking of which, when we go back and talk about reparations, do we do, 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 does America get a little mulligan for the Civil War? You're talking about six or 700,000 people, both sides who died, uh, in, a, in a population of 10% the size of America right now. Translate that, that's 7 million Americans that died uh, in the fight over slavery. Half of them died uh, in order to stop slavery. Uh, and millions more were, were maimed, again, relative to the size of this country. Does America get some sort of offset for that? And I remember reading, recently rereading the autobiography of Frederick Douglass, born a slave, as you know, escaped from his plantation in Maryland and went to Massachusetts. And when he walked around, he was shocked and how prosperous Massachusetts was and how many blacks were more prosperous than some of the wealthiest whites uh, in, in Maryland. He thought, as most people did in those days, that you could not become wealthy without slavery. And that's the other point. The thing that critical race theory does is it localizes slavery, acts as if it's a black-white thing, an American-black, American-white thing, when, in fact, you go throughout human history, and slavery, unfortunately, has always been a constant. Uh, Caucasians enslaved Caucasians. In fact, uh, the northern uh, Muslim pirates out of North Africa took more whites out of um, the Mediterranean than Europeans took blacks out of Africa and took to what, it, what became North America. And Arab slavers began uh, the slave trade out of Africa hundreds of years before the Europeans did and kept going after the Europeans stopped. So after we pay black people reparations, do we then go to Africa and get our part and then go to Arab world and get our part? And have this kind of cross navigation of, of lawsuits back and forth. The whole thing is absurd. And in 1940, 
87% of black live below the federally defined level of poverty. 20 years later, that number had dropped to 47%. That's a 40-point drop in 20 years, the greatest 20-year period of economic expansion for blacks in the history of America. And that was before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the, voting, the, the Housing Act of 68, all of which were important. But, they, but the point is, despite Jim Crow, despite this prejudice, Black people still prospered. Why? Because they still had nuclear strong, intact families that embraced education. You two know of my closest friends, two of my closest friends are Thomas Sowell and the late Walter Williams. They both are about the same age. They grew up in the 40s. Uh, Thomas Sowell grew up in East Harlem in the 40s, and um, Walter Williams grew up in Philadelphia in the 40s. Walter Williams' father abandoned the family. And uh, Thomas Sowell never knew his mother or father. They both died when he was very, very young. He was raised by his, um, uh, by his relatives. Both said they were the only person in their neighborhoods, the only one who did not have a father in the house. Fast forward now, and the reverse of that is true. 70% of black kids uh, enter, the country, enter the world without a father married to the mother. And forget about elder. We talked about this before. Obama once said a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in jail. Now, the question we ought to be having, the critical race theorists ought to be putting their, their brain power into how the hell do we go from having 25% of black kids outside of wedlock in 1965, when clearly the country was more racist than right now, to 70% right now? And the answer is the welfare state has incentivized women to marry the government and has incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. And we're not having a discussion about that. We're having a discussion about the symptoms, about the consequences. The consequences of that are an unequal society. The consequences of that are bad schools. The consequences of that uh, are crime. But we're talking about the consequences, not, not about the source. We ought to be talking about the source. Well, you know what's amazing is that you look at the Trump years and, and the, the critical race theory kind of went away a little bit, at least from, from, the, from the popular conversation, because the unemployment rate for, for all Americans, but especially minority Americans, was at historic. That's not a, a, an annual or a decade historic lows. Wages were rising. Black home ownership was up. Black owned businesses was up. And then came the pandemic. But before that, before the pandemic, Trump was going to sail to re-election. He even did get more black votes in 2020 than he got in 2016 because of his economic policies. And, and what are conservatives promoting? We promote school choice. We promote charter schools. And what did Trump promote? He promoted opportunity scholarships and historic black colleges and universities. The path to success is an education if you're teaching the right things. CRT does not teach kids, doesn't matter what kids it is, about supply and demand or international, uh, you know, trade or any of these things, not even computers. It teaches them to follow this rigid Marxist ideology and make people like Ibram X. Kendi rich in the process. Absolutely. Uh, let me give you some numbers. Four, six, eight, twelve. 4% is the percentage of the black vote the Republican presidential candidate got in 2008 when Obama first ran. 6% is the percentage they got uh, after Obama presided over the worst economic recovery uh, since 1949. 8% is what Republicans got when Donald Trump ran with, what, with the mantra, what do you have to lose? And 12% uh, is what Donald Trump got when he delivered, as you pointed out, the best unemployment records uh, for blacks in the history of America. That's a 50% increase in the black vote. Uh, Jason Riley, one of the editors of the Wall Street Journal, wrote a book called Please Stop Helping Us about all these left-wing policies that people on the left uh, pursue that make things worse, not least of which, of course, is the welfare state. But one of them is Jimmy Carter uh, passing, signing the Community Reinvestment Act that Bill Clinton gave teeth to that basically pressured banks uh, through carrot and stick, in the changing lending criteria, so basically anybody who could fog up a mirror could get a home. Along comes a recession, and a whole bunch of people, a disproportionate percentage of whom were black, got homes that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten because they weren't credit worthy, would have been perfectly, ha uh, perfectly better off renting, but they got a home, put a bunch of money into it, lost it all. So between 2010 and 2013, when Obama was president, black net worth literally fell a full third, I kid you not. And I do blame Obama, because when Obama was a private lawyer, he joined other lawyers in filing a class action lawsuit against Citibank, claiming that would-be black borrowers were being denied mortgages because of racism. So Citicorp said, OK, gave the mortgages to 168 uh, plaintiffs, 
and all of them, but about 18 or 19, lost their homes because it turns out they weren't credit worthy. So those black people were worse off because of left-wing policies pushed by people like Jimmy Carter uh, and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Please stop helping us. Get out of the way. You're absolutely right. There are three things you need to do in order to escape poverty. Number one, finish high school. Ideally, high school where you can, in fact, read, write, and compute at grade level. Number two, don't have a kid before you get married. Uh, and get married uh, and don't have a kid until you're at least 20 years old. And number three, get a job. Keep that job. Don't quit that job until you get another job. And I would add one more thing that uh, Walter Williams would add, and that is avoid the criminal justice system. You do that, you will not be poor. You don't do that, there's a good chance you will be. That's something called the success sequence that a left-wing think tank called the Brookings Institution put out, left-wing, and they didn't say, by the way, this does not apply to black people. <laughs> we only got about 90 seconds, but you, you, know, you know what's fascinating to me is what a, a lot of people who are receiving the message of critical race that you don't understand is that in the end, it won't matter if you're BIPOC or white or whatever, what they want to do is trade one form of oppression for another. We're all going to be the proletariat class. We're all going to be waiting in line. And, and people like Ibram X. Kendi and Robin DeAngelis, they're going to have made millions on this industry. There they are saying, capitalism is racist and the only way to be anti-racist is to be anti-capitalist and by the way buy my book at target right <laughs> and again the reason they're doing this is four six eight twelve if that number gets to 15 20 percent of the black vote they are done and they are scared to death that's why they're doubling down on systemic racism that's why joe biden goes to tulsa and by the way he said i'm the first president to come here on the 100th anniversary of tulsa that's because it's the 100th anniversary <laughs> they've only had one uh, it's, only, it's only one hundredth <laughs> anniversary I, i'll tell you this i got i got a wrap here when the second film comes out please make sure this is one of the first programs that you come on i watched the first film it was incredible. It was awesome to have you on this program. When the second film comes out, please make this one of your first stops. Will do. And by the way, the first one's available just on YouTube now. It's about $2.99, so it's uh, really down cheap. So I urge everybody to see it, especially if you're left wing. All right, Larry, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. On a side note, it's easy to feel discouraged, frustrated, and at your wit's end when conversations about CRT are taking place, especially from a conservative point of view, but all is not lost. Check out this video of a dad and his daughter that went viral last week. Daddy teaches you you can be anything in this world that you want to be, right? Don't daddy teach you that? Yeah, and it doesn't matter if you're black or white or any color. Doesn't matter if you're black, white, brown, yellow. yellow. Right? Black. And, and how we treat people is based on who yeah. they are and not and what color nice. they are. And if they're nice and smart. See? This is, how, this is how children think right here. Critical race theory wants to end that. Not with my children. It's not going to happen. My baby's going to know that no matter what she wants to be in life, all she has to do is work hard and she can become that. Work hard even though you don't know anyone. You can make friends. <laughs> Yeah, you can make friends, no matter what color they are. So we need to stop CRT, period, point blank. Children do not see skin color, man. They love everybody. If they're good people, they love them. We pray for people that are hurt. I, I know what you're thinking. It's, it's awesome, right? It's, it's just incredible. But you know what? That video was so dangerous that TikTok took it down. All right, while I'm here in Texas, I want to bring in a friend and fellow Blaze TV personality, host of the Chad Prather Show. Chad, thanks for joining us. Good to be with you, Andrew. Um, boy, we're doing a lot on critical race theory, and that might tie to you. You're running for governor of Texas? I know. People think it's a gimmick. It's not. I don't think, I don't think it's a gimmick. Real deal. Before we get into CRT, why? Because I'm just, uh, let me set this up. I live in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. We have a governor named Phil Murphy who's literally destroying the state. I would take Greg Abbott or Ron DeSantis tomorrow. Hey, look, so, there, there's no question about that. I mean, there's no question. There's a lot of states out there that would do well to have a Greg Abbott. But this is Texas. And right now, Texas is being out-Texased by other states. Uh, and Texas just isn't is that Texas. Florida? Florida's one. Uh, South Dakota, in many cases, Tennessee? is another. Tennessee's not doing bad. There's a few of them that are out there. That, And I keep saying that Texas isn't the Texas that most Texans think it is. 
anymore. Uh, we, we've, we've backed off. We've kind of become, a, um, it's like going back to the future. We, we, Greg Abbott looks to, to see what Ron DeSantis says, sticks his finger in the air, tests the air. Five days later, he says the same thing. The difference is he's not doing the things DeSantis is doing, even though he's saying the same things. Those have got to change. You know, it, I, I know that you you have governors like like Rick Perry mm -hmm. that became known as Governor Gardasil, right? So <laughs> on most issues, I mean, at least from the perspective of a New Jerseyan, I, I, again, I would take Rick Perry any day of the week, but you have governors that sometimes fall into these traps like the Gardasil issue, and then all of a sudden Texans go, all right, you're yeah. done. We need someone else. So you, you take the, the shutdowns last year, the mandates that happened. When, whenever you have a governor that really did not seek counsel from the inner circle of leadership representation here in Texas, he didn't go to his lieutenant governor, didn't go to his AG, uh, only sought about 5% of counsel from the legislators themselves, but then unilaterally, and I will say dictatorially, shut down the state. Ruined small business, closes houses of worship, uh, ruined lives, uh, masked everybody up multiple times, uh, shut things down. When Is that people, his Gardasil moment? It really was. A lot of Texans are going to, that's an that's a unpardonable sin in so many cases. And then does it at a time in the, in the month where people's rent are coming up 10 days later and now they can't go to work. To, I mean, it was just bad timing. It was bad optics all the way around. It was a bad decision. See, I, again, I, again, living in New Jersey, I mean... Have you seen our governor? <laughs> I mean, I mean, New Jersey is literally bleeding people yeah. into states like Texas and Florida. I apologize for that on some level. <laughs> um, not all of us are bad. If I ever move out of the state, the first thing I'm doing is putting a don't tread on me flag out front to, you know, signal that I'm, I'm here yeah. for all the right reasons. But we look, I look at my state and the absolute over, I mean, if it weren't for Governor Cuomo, Murphy would be the worst governor in the country. But maybe, maybe, maybe Newsom. Well, I was going to say Whitmer when she Whitmer. banned purchasing potting soil and seed. I, I don't know why that was the most <laughs> dangerous thing in Michigan. Yeah. But as far as New Jersey goes, I mean, we have like 12 different issues before we get to did we have a mask mandate or did we have Gardasil or do, did we have any of these things that Texans you know, get, get upset about? We can't even get our taxes under control. We can't even get respect for the Second Amendment. You know, you, you, uh, Abbott, to his credit, is talking about border security. We're giving out driver's licenses to illegals. Well, yeah. I can't get out there on the road. Yeah, we, we have been fortunate in a, in a lot of respects in that regard. But we're coming from a different place. We're coming from a different foundation. Texas still sees itself in many ways as a republic. It sees itself as the state among states. It's not one of 49, it's the one. Uh, and to the average Texan, with that sense of humble arrogance that they carry here, people say everything's bigger in Texas, not the least of which is the attitude of being a Texan. And they carry that very heavily here. And to tread on those Texas liberties, or at least what they perceive to be their freedoms, uh, that's a cardinal sin. Do you have a clash? Because, you know, we're the ones, we don't have a clash in New Jersey because everyone in New Jersey's from New Jersey or New York, right? right. Um, but you're now experiencing a wave of people from California, yeah. a wave of people from Chicago, a wave of people from New York who do things like pick up and move to a place like Texas, then start giving you a lecture hmm. about why you need bike paths or, <laughs> or, you know, or drag queen story hour. Do you see a conflict between the Texans you describe and the people that are moving into Texas, and there's a difference. Yeah, I wish there was a way constitutionally to be able to say that anybody moving into the state of Texas should have a four-year probationary period before they can vote, just so you can embrace the culture. Because I always say Texas is not taught, it's caught. You either see it or you don't see it. I also make the argument statistically where a lot of conservatives are moving to Texas. There's a lot of liberals with liberal mindset, liberal policy ideas that are moving to Austin, had a newspaper reporter ask me the other day, she said, how would you feel being in Austin since, all, you think you could function there since Austin's not like the rest of Texas? And I said, that right there is the problem. The fact that Austin doesn't represent the rest of Texas, and that's our issue. Yeah, that's, that's our issue. So we see a lot of liberals, a lot of big business, a lot of corporate, a lot of Silicon Valley coming into the Austin area. But a lot of the folks come from California, New York, even Europe who are coming here. They're coming to the average Texas, and they're coming to seek conservative values. So it's an interesting immigration happening. I always thought that you should put a B apostrophe before Austin. <laughs> they could just make it Boston because it is. Yeah. That's, that's my attempt at a joke. Critical race theory is mm -hmm. now making its way even into Texas. And... We're being told that if we don't embrace Marxism, that we're, we're all racists. You even have Ibram X. Kendi, who says the only way to be anti-racist is to be anti-capitalist, 
and buy my book on Target, uh, Target.com, right. by the way. And, you know, there, I think there's a lot of people in Texas of all races that are rejecting this, but it is making its way into your government-run schools. Yeah. So we saw this happen recently in the South Lake Carroll School District. We saw where, and by the way, it was a perfect example of Texans stepping up, going to the polls, and massively voting this thing down. This is what democracy looks like, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> they came in and said, no, this is not our community, this is not our city, this is not representative of who we are, and we're going to demonstrate that, and they voted it down uh, proudly and thankfully so. Critical race theory is an interesting thing. I have a, you know, the way I look at this is, is a, a black guy and a white guy come into a bar. I'm the bartender. If I serve the black guy first, then I'm a racist because I gave him preferential treatment, right? Just to prove that I don't have white guilt and I'm going to be, you know, woke. Uh, if I serve the white guy first, well, you know the obvious answer to that. You're also That's, a racist. I'm also a racist. So it's a no-win situation. This is a form of mind control that ultimately puts people into a mental slavery. The mental slavery ultimately will put you in an economic slavery, hence Marxism. So they can't come in and say, okay, we're going to repay you for historic slavery and what you did to the, to the black culture in the, in the 16, 1700s, 1800s of the United States. But what we can do is we can put you in a mental slavery. And that's what they're doing. And the quickest way they can do that is through the educational system. And that's why they're invading everything they can do. If they can get that in there, make it part of a, literally part of a curriculum, then it has to be taught. It has to be. Uh, this, you know, I, say, I keep saying that public schools across the nation are really just brainwashing institutions. They really are. They're indoctrination camps. The further we can take this, we already know that they've watered down socialism by putting the word democratic in front of it. Now we're, we're full-blown into Marxism. These are trained Marxists. These are avowed Marxists. BLM is a Marxist organization across the board. And now, if you oppose that, we've seen the game plan. They call you a racist. You've got to bow to it. Because what's worse than being called a Nazi or a racist or, or an insurrectionist or anything else? It's, but it's also guilty until... I Proven guess, innocent, right. right. And, and, but, and that never happens, by the way. But, but here's what I understand about Texas. This was Juneteenth, mm -hmm. right? This is where right. it happened. Right. The Texas Republican Party was founded by mm -hmm. black men, wasn't it? The head of the Texas GOP right now is Alan West. Right. When I talk about people moving in versus people that are from here, shouldn't the first people that reject Marxism and critical race theory be black Texans? Yeah, sure, 100%. And I will add an addendum to the, your statement of Alan West. Uh, if Alan West decides uh, to jump into this gubernatorial run, he will be the front runner to oppose Greg Abbott in this situation. By and large, he is highly supported in this state. So you're right. Uh, this, is a, this is a state that epitomizes freedom. It epitomizes equality of opportunity. It is a place of success. No, nowhere else uh, demonstrates and and it uh, illustrates the American dream like Texas does. Everybody's got an opportunity here. Uh, this, this is across the board a bad false narrative. This critical race theory thing comes, comes down to a very simple human nature element, and that is this. We love to label people. If we can label them, we can put them in the box. If we can put them in a box, we can put them on the shelf, we can categorize them, and then we don't have to deal with them anymore. Every time we walk past this person, this political group, this ideology, this religious, this church, whatever it may be, we say, oh, they're that. And once we've done that, we've marginalized them to the point where they become irrelevant. i got to leave it there. Good luck in the race. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Maybe I'll jump on the Chad yeah, Prather show one day. I think you should. All right, all right, all right. We've got to end it there, Chad. Thanks for joining you us. Bet. All right, here we go. Time now for parting shots. And today's parting shot is at the producers of the kids' show Blue's Clues, which, to the best of my knowledge as a parent of three, was a totally innocent, safe program until now. Check this out. Families marching four by four, hurrah, hurrah. Families marching four by four, hurrah, hurrah. Trans members of this family all love each other so proudly, and they all go marching in. The big parade. I don't care if it's Pride Month. People have the freedom of speech. They have the freedom of assembly. They have the right to express themselves in these United States of America. But you know what? It's really kind of sick and twisted when you present this stuff to four- and five-year-olds. Four- and five-year-olds don't need to know about trans parents or transgenderism or bisexuality or any of this other stuff. You all saw that video from the Dalton School about kids touching themselves. This is that times 10. And sickos, perverts, and weirdos are getting at your kids all over the place. 
on YouTube, on the internet, in video games, and in public school, and on shows that you thought were safe for your kids. They're not. We're right. They're wrong. That's the end of the story. The arguments on this television program cannot be broken. Make sure you catch me on Sirius XM Patriot Channel 125, noon to 3 east, 9 to noon west. From Dallas, Texas, I'm Andrew Wilkow. Thank you for watching Blaze TV.